Matthew chapter 16, come on, does anybody need a word from the Lord today? Did anybody come hungry for God to speak to them today? Come on and get your Bible and let's go into the gospel of Matthew. We're going to Matthew chapter 16 just for a few minutes this morning. We'll start with verse number 24. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake, he will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father. And then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Father, now we thank you for your word and we ask for you to speak to us today, Lord. In the name of Jesus. How many Christians do we have here in the room? Are you a Christian? What does it mean to be a Christian? What does it look like? What are the marks of a Christian? Luke actually recorded in Acts chapter 11 that it was in the city of Antioch where the disciples were first called Christians. Now, as the people called the disciples Christians, they weren't patting them on the back. They weren't saying this to be nice. <laughs> it was actually derogatory when it was said in the beginning. But what was it about these early disciples that led others to categorize them as Christ followers? Christ's ones, little Christ. Christian. I wonder if people watched you for a week, for a month, for a year, would they categorize you after the one you claim to follow? Today is week three of our series Q&A. This is a study about the questions that Jesus asked. There are over 270 questions Jesus asked. The question for today, what will it profit a man? What will it profit a man? We might all also ask this, what are the marks of a Christian? I hope you take some notes today that I believe are going to be very helpful to you in your walk. This teaching comes as a result of the disciples' faulty perception of Jesus as the Messiah. If you'll remember, two weeks ago, we started this series by studying a, a question that Jesus asked. He, he said, who do men say that I am? And there was some speculation. Some said, well, some think that you might be John the Baptist raised from the dead, reincarnated. Some are speculating that you might be Elijah. Some are speculating you might be Jeremiah. Some just think you're some other prophet that we don't even know about yet. And then Jesus, if you remember, he asked Peter, who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are the anointed one. You're the one that we've been waiting for. You're the one the prophets prophesied about. And while Peter answered correctly, correctly, he and the other disciples didn't really have the proper understanding of what it meant for him to be the Messiah. They still thought Jesus was going to set up his kingdom in Jerusalem. They thought Jesus was going to build his kingdom on earth. And although Jesus commended Peter 
for the revelation from the Father. He said, this didn't come from you. This came from the Father. This came from heaven. He did go on to tell them, don't tell anyone that I'm the Messiah. Let's back up a little bit from our text. You'll see this in verse number 20. Jesus strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Messiah. Why? If Peter understood that he was the Messiah and Jesus went on to say, You are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Peter didn't have clear understanding. He had faulty perception of Jesus as a Messiah. I believe that Jesus told his disciples not to tell anyone because he still needed to teach them a few things. Let me read on in verse number 21. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples or to teach his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and it goes as far as to say that he would be killed, and then on the third day, he would be raised. And we know that Peter didn't truly understand this. He didn't like this, because Peter goes on to say this in verse number 22. Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. Let me just say right here, that's probably not the smartest thing for anybody to do. Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him and said, Far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you, Lord. But Jesus turned back to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. Huh. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind. Get this today. You are not setting your mind on the things of God. You are setting your mind on the things of man. You're not setting your mind on the things of heaven. You're setting your mind on the things of earth. Now, when Jesus said, get behind me, Satan, Peter was not Satan. Peter was actually not the attacker. He was a conduit for the enemy. And remember, Peter is a sold-out Christ follower. He's one of the top 12 Christ followers. He's one of the original Christ followers, and he could still be used by the enemy to be a conduit. I hope somebody gets this. That's not my sermon, but don't miss that point. I wonder how often the enemy has used you, how often the enemy has used me as a conduit. Maybe I will preach that after all. I don't know. It's worth thinking about, though, isn't it? I don't ever want the enemy to use me as a conduit or a hindrance. Satan was using Peter to try and accomplish his mission. Satan was trying to keep Jesus from the cross, which is exactly how he tried to tempt Jesus in the wilderness. If you go back and study Jesus' time in the wilderness, one of the same tactics that he tried then, he was trying again here. Don't choose the cross, choose a kingdom here on earth instead, which is exactly how t the enemy tempts us today. Don't choose the cross, choose a kingdom here instead. Build your kingdom here. And so many people do this. But Jesus has a different kingdom in mind, a kingdom he had come to usher in, which is why he taught us to pray in Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You see, we want the crown, but we don't want the cross. Come on, somebody, are you out there today? But can I tell you, there's no crown without the cross. Jesus emphasizes three things in our text today. He emphasizes the call. He emphasizes the conflict. And he emphasizes his coming. Let's start here. First of all, let's look at the call. Go back to verse 24 of our text. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me. There it is. There's the call. Notice, the call is for whom? 
If anyone, I love that. Anyone. It's a universal call. Much like John 3.16. Does anybody remember John 3.16? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Come on and say it with me. That. Stop. God loves this world so much that He gave His only Son that whosoever. The call is for anyone. And it is a universal call. No matter your race, no matter your gender, no matter your age, those who are married, those who are divorced, those who are single, single, it doesn't matter how many mistakes you've made. It doesn't matter your failures. He invites all of us to come. The call is for you. Jesus calls to you today. Come to me, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. All who labor and are heavy laden. What does he promise to give us? Come on, somebody. Anybody need rest today? Look at this invitation. Look at this call. Come to me, all who are weary who are heavy laden, sounds like the world we live in today. You can lay down your weariness and pick up His peace. Anybody need the peace of God which surpasses understanding in your life today? What a wonderful exchange. Come to me and I will give you rest. Sadly, some will not respond to the call because of the cost. Many refuse to respond to the call because of the cost. Let me talk to you about the cost. The cost will be paid by few. Matthew twenty sixteen, Jesus said many are called and few are chosen. That is... Few will choose to answer the call. The call goes out to everyone. The question is, who will answer the call? Many are called. Few will choose to answer the call. So what is the cost? Well, it's laid out in our text today. Three parts of the cost. Let me bring it to your attention. What does Jesus first say? Deny. Whoever would follow me, he said, start here. Deny yourself. And boy, that's easier said than done, isn't it? Because if we're honest with ourselves, we would admit <laughs> that we are selfish. And I'll admit to you and to the Lord, I'm selfish. I have to fight against it every day. And so do you. We're just born that way. We're born selfish. We're born wanting our own way and wanting our own will. We have to deny ourselves. Denying calls for disowning. Disowning yourself. Recognizing your life is not really your own anyway. My life belongs to the Lord. My life belongs to God. We dedicated this beautiful, beautiful little girl today. And we declare together as a family and as a church family, she is yours, God. We'll do our part as long as we have her, but she is yours. I raised my son not knowing that he would be called into ministry. My prayer as a father our prayer as parents, we were hoping that, Jesus, uh, that Elliot uh, would find Jesus and decide to follow Jesus on his own. And thankfully, he has done that. Not knowing that God would then call him to a life of ministry. 
He's been a great youth pastor for us for how many years now? Six, seven years? It's crazy. And God's been training him and shaping him, teaching him how to deny himself. Now he's, he and Tanner are U.S. missionaries. Isn't that crazy? We got another missionary in our house, Jackie. Isn't that the coolest thing? God's raising up missionaries out of our house. But your life is not your own. My life is not my own. That's what denying is really talking about. It's disowning yourself. Recognizing your life is not your own. Denying also calls for discipline. Maybe just write that down, those who are taking notes. Discipline. We're talking about daily discipline. <laughs> Daily, come on somebody, daily discipline. How are you in, the, in, in your study of the Word, your reading of the Word, your devotional time? It takes daily discipline. You have to deny yourself. Discipline in the Word, discipline in prayer, discipline in worship, discipline in church attendance. I am, I've got to just say this. For the record, I'm shocked at how many people use the pandemic as an excuse not to get into the house of God. Now, there are some legitimate reasons, perhaps, but I'm talking about people who've used it as an excuse. Well, I can say that because they're not here. But it, it breaks my heart, actually. It breaks my heart. We got to be disciplined. We got to start. The cost, it's costly. Starts here denial. Deny. What else is part of the cost? It's heavy. <laughs> it's heavy. Take up your cross, carry your cross. If anyone would come to me, here's the, here's the price. Let him deny himself, let him take up his cross. You know, denying yourself is one thing. Dying to self, come on. That's a whole other subject. What does this mean? Well, uh, sadly, we have softened this. We've watered this down so much today. We, equ we equate a cross with a job, a boss, a troublesome neighbor, possibly a mother-in-law. Not me, of course. She's my favorite mother-in-law. I do love, she's more like a mom than a mother-in-law to me. I love her. I heard one girl on a reality show say, don't hate me because I'm beautiful. It's just the cross I have to bear. You and me both, honey. But what does Jesus have in mind when he calls us to take up and carry our cross? It is the willingness to endure persecution, rejection, reproach, shame, suffering, and maybe, just maybe, even martyrdom for His sake. And nothing less, church. What are the disciples thinking when Jesus says this? Well, let me make it clear to you. For one thing, they're not thinking about Jesus on the cross because that hasn't happened yet. They're thinking of the crucifixions that were so common at the time. One historian estimates about 30,000 crucifixions occurred around the time of Jesus on earth. So when Jesus says, take up your cross, they see the condemned marching along a road with their own instrument of death strapped to their backs. To them, a cross meant death martyrdom, which is precisely what Jesus is talking about here. The third part of the cost. Deny yourself, carry your cross, and follow me. Follow me. If anyone would come after me, verse 24 of our text, one more time, let him deny himself, Take up his cross and follow me. This literally translates be following 
me. It is a continuous way of life. It doesn't stop. It keeps on going. It's synonymous with imitation. Let him imitate me. 1 John 2, 6 says this, Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. And herein lies the dilemma. Herein lies the conflict. Let me talk to you just a few minutes about the conflict. The disciples were presented with a choice. A very conflicting choice. Verse 25 of our text, Whoever would save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake, he will find it. Let me explain. Jesus is saying that whoever lives only to save his earthly, physical life, whoever lives for ease and for comfort and for self-indulgence, will lose his spiritual, eternal soul. But whoever is willing to give up his earthly physical life, deny himself, bear the cross, follow in obedience the lordship of Jesus, to possibly even lose his life for Jesus' sake, that person will save his eternal spiritual soul. And This was the disciples' conflict. And if we're honest today, it is ours. It is our conflict. And this is what we battle, grasping some of the teaching of Jesus, that we win by losing, that if we abandon our lives, we will gain our lives forever, that greatness comes in serving and in lowliness, that when we give, we get, when we give, we gain, and that we live by dying Scripture goes on to reiterate this over and over and over again. Romans 12, 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Colossians 3, 3. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Romans 6.4, we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. Philippians 1.21, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And I want you to look at this passage from John chapter 12, verse 23. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. So what's it going to be, church? We have a choice, just as the disciples did. Will you live for this life now and lose eternal life later and forever? Or will you sacrifice possibly now? Be willing to be persecuted now and live forever with the Father. We can go for it now and lose it forever, or we can give it up now and gain it forever. You might be saying, Do you, are you saying, Pastor Steve, that I have to be a martyr? Well, in reality, those of us in this room will probably not die a martyr's death. But that's not the case for Christians, some Christians around the world. Just ask the Afghani believers who are in hiding today, fearful of losing their lives for being a Christian. You may not be called to be a martyr's, to die a martyr's death, but I would guess there's probably some things in your life that need to die for the cause of Christ. 
I think the point is here, we should be willing to lose our lives for the cause of Christ and gain eternal life rather than spend our lives trying to get it all here and, and lose it forever. Isn't this the point of our text really today? And all this leads to Jesus' final emphasis in our text, his coming. Ah. And we say together today, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Come quickly. For the Son of Man is going to come, verse 27, with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person, each person, according to what he has done. What do we learn about his coming? Well, we learn this. His coming is certain. He said emphatically, for the Son of Man is going to come. Please don't be fooled into thinking that because his coming has been delayed, that he's not coming. He is coming. And I don't know about you, but I think it could be soon. And even if it's not, we should live our lives as though he would return today. If you knew that he was coming today, what urgency would you have to get on the phone? Who would you have to call? If you had the inside scoop, if you knew that tomorrow was the day, let's say, and you had a 12-hour period of time to call some people, who would you call? Who would you give that tip to? See, we don't live our lives as though he's coming soon if we live our lives as though he's coming at all. But he did say he's coming emphatically. His coming is certain. It's just nobody knows when this is going to happen, Matthew 24, 36. But concerning that day, concerning that hour, no one knows. Not even the angels know. Not even Jesus saying, I don't even know. I just have to be ready. And when my father elbows me, when my father cues me, when my father says today is that day, today is that day, and I've got to be ready. It's like Butler. She had to have a bag packed. She had to be ready in case her water broke. It was, you know, there's a due date, right? But rarely do, does, does the baby come on the due date. That baby's going to come when that baby wants to come, unless it's a scheduled cesarean. Congratulations to Gabe and Christina. I don't know if they're watching or not, but Hazel's here. Congratulations to the grandparents as well. Uh, wow, I, I, I can't believe how it is to be a grandparent. I can't believe the joy that it is. So congratulations. Gabe and Christina had Hazel over the weekend. No one knows the day. No one knows the hour. But you better be ready. You better be ready. Because his coming is certain. And he's coming with rewards. That's what the Bible says, right? That's what the te text tells us today. We're studying this. I've got my magnifying glass out for you. We're going line by line. We're going word by word. The, the Bible says in our text that he's going to reward. There's going to be a payment. A, a re, I will repay those, I think is how it says. I will repay each person according to what he's done. So if you've been doing your part and you're not living for this world, you're not living for earthly treasure, you're living for eternal life and you're storing up treasure in heaven where the moth can't get to it where the rust can't get to it then you don't have to worry today you will be rewarded accordingly because he's coming with rewards the flip side to that record you know there's an a side that everybody wears out and everybody likes to play that side right then there's a b side that never gets played Nobody knew what that song was. There's a B-side. Not only are the rewards, see, we like to hear that, we like to play that. There's consequences. His coming is certain. He's coming with rewards. But hear me today, church. 
And let me close this message. He's coming with consequences. Because sadly, those who refuse to answer the call or their answer is simply, no, I don't want to follow. I don't, want, I don't like the cost of that. I mean, Jesus started getting really tough with his teaching. You got to eat my flesh. You got to drink my blood. Hang on a minute. I mean, we gathered around the table of the Lord and we took a wafer and we drank some juice that represents his broken body, that represents his shed blood. But when Jesus started talking about, you've got to eat my flesh and you've got to drink my blood, some of the ones who started to follow him, they said, we're out. That's too much. When Jesus said, will you also leave me? Another question, I just might, I might preach on that. I'm not sure yet. It's a high cost, isn't it? Paul warned the Corinthians there's a, a judgment day coming. So whether we are at home or away, 2 Corinthians 5, we make it our aim to please Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ one day so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body. Whether it's good, whether it's evil. Those who have chosen to deny themselves, take up their cross and follow Christ. They'll be eternally rewarded for that. But sadly, those who've chosen to live for themselves, build up their earthly treasure here, they will suffer eternal consequences. Jesus was saying to his disciples then and to us now, Come to me. Give your life away. Take up your cross and follow me. And if you do, you will receive eternal life. And do it now, by the way, because there's a day coming when that chance will be gone. He's saying, persevere. Be faithful. Follow the path of self-denial, cross-bearing, and loyal obedience because... A reward is coming. Here's our question today. Verse number 26. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? Would you bow your heads today, please? Father, we are grateful for your word the richness of your word. And Jesus, we are listening even today to the questions that you have asked. I pray that, Lord, what I have said will be embedded in our hearts and spirits and our minds, and it would shape us and make us what you have called us to be.